other meetings. We appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to the fourth annual Mark Marshall Memorial Lecture Series. Uh, it's a privilege uh, to be your host. I'm Kareem Damji, Chair of the Department. And uh, this is our first uh, virtual uh, Mark Marshall Lecture, and um, for good reason, as you all know. Uh, but also because um, the theme is appropriate uh, um, in terms of virtual care and uh, enhancing quality of care. Uh, I think it um, is great to be able to have it uh, this way. I would like to begin actually by paying tribute um, to all the people uh, that are joining us today, uh, and in particular members of our department and the Eye Institute uh, for the wonderful care uh, that you're offering uh, to patients, uh, but also to each other uh, in this difficult period. And I think that spirit of caring and sharing and bringing out the best uh, in each of us uh, is something that was uh, a feature of Dr. Mark Marshall, and you'll hear more about him, but um, it's in that spirit as well that I wish to pay tribute to each of you for the hard work and effort that you're putting in, uh, and please keep it up, and uh, we'll weather the storm together and uh, get through it. Uh, I know that's a, an expression that Dean Himmelgarn often uses and uh, one that resonates with me as well. So um, I would like to be able to uh, begin um, by sharing with you a short introduction for Dean uh, Himmelgarn. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Brenda. Um, Brenda graduated uh, and is a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. Uh, and she holds the Roy and V. Bay Chair in Kidney Research. She was previously professor of, in the Department of Medicine and the head of the Department of Community Health Sciences at the University of Calgary, Cummings School of Medicine and has over 35 years of experience in healthcare, including as a practicing nurse, physician, researcher, academic, and administrator. And I have to say it's a real privilege uh, serving with you. And thank you so much for joining us uh, on this uh, historic occasion. Uh, Brenda, over to you. Thank you very much, Karim, and thank you for the opportunity to, to be here today. The Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry is so proud to see the, the fourth annual Mark Marshall Memorial Lecture Series in 2020 go ahead with the virtual format. And as you said, Karim, what a fitting way for us to connect on the theme for this year, tele-ophthalmology. This branch of telemedicine, which delivers eye care through digital medical equipment and telecommunications technology, opens up so many promising possibilities. And we're going to hear about that this morning as well provides greater access to eye specialists for patients in remote areas and more precise disease screening, diagnosis and monitoring. And also such wonderful opportunities for learners. And I think we've really come to appreciate that during this COVID pandemic that we, we have to do things differently. And this is a perfect example of that. So I said to Karim the other day, your leaders um, in, the, in this area of work and have guided so many others as we're living in this virtual format. As Dean, I'm pleased to celebrate with you the decades of excellence and growth of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences and the long lasting legacy of Dr. Mark Marshall. A first World War veteran, Dr. Marshall did an outstanding job as chair of what was then the Department of Ophthalmology and Rhino Otolaryngology. And he was a key leader in the development of the U of A's first residency programs. He provided the University of Alberta with his own, what's known as the Marshall Plan for the development of postgraduate training programs, which really helped Second World War veterans continue with specialized medical education after their service. Many trainees of that time refer to him as the father of postgraduate training. Dr. Marshall's pioneering contributions to ophthalmology really paved the way for so many milestones the first corneal transplant in Western Canada by Dr. Don Hassard in 1962, the development of teleophthalmology in 1999, the development of a world-class ophthalmologic simulation center by Dr. Morley Kuzner in 2014, and the first ocular gene therapy trial in Canada in 2015. Dr. Marshall's leadership his tireless work and his dedication to medicine and ophthalmology are reflected in the quality of the training we offer here at the University of Alberta and the dedicated professionals who 
proudly teach these residents every day. Our program, our residency training program, turns out the majority actually of ophthalmologists practicing in Western Canada, and many of them are here in this room today. Our graduates are international thought leaders in eye care and compassionate caregivers, finding new approaches to several subspecialties, extra business, glaucoma, and the cornea. I also want to recognize uh, the department in particular and the Eye Institute and the world-renowned stature under the leadership of Dr. Damji. You provide outstanding clinical care to over 3 million people in Northern Alberta. The quality of your staff at all levels from ophthalmologists to nurses to technicians at various locations that you work in from the Stollery Pediatric Ophthalmology Clinic, the Cates Clinical Trials and Basic Research Units, the Royal Alexander, which is your hub, Port Saskatchewan, Westview Health Center. Your, your reach is far reaching and your care is outstanding. And it really provides that rich, outstanding clinical care and rich training environments for our residents. And I wanna thank you all for that. This Marshall Lecture Series is not only a tribute to Dr. Marshall's legacy, but an opportunity to celebrate our future together, to share how we're working together to find health solutions and to inspire today's professionals in ophthalmology and other areas as well. These con lectures connect us to, to bigger questions in the broader Canadian healthcare system. And they invite us to contemplate how we can continue to forge new paths and break new ground. And that's why it's so exciting to be here today and have this lecture series. So I'm thrilled to see our faculty continuing to adapt with the future facing drive. And we'll hear about that today that builds on this distinguished tradition of ophthalmology. I hope that you enjoyed today's lecture and thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Brenda. Um, really appreciate those words, uh, visiting our heritage and looking ahead and uh, the compliments that you've paid. And um, must say that um, it's uh, once again, a privilege to serve with you and wonderful leaders, uh, both on the university side, the HS side, so that all together we can continue to make a difference and carry Dr. Marshall's spirit forward. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, before I do the introduction uh, for our team who's presenting this year, instead of a single individual, I just wanted to uh, highlight that Dr. Rod Morgan was our first lecturer in 2017, and then Bill Pierce uh, in 2018. Bill actually spoke about the North and contributions of the department in the North uh, physically. And so it's nice that we're speaking about uh, access through uh, technology today as well. And in 2019, of course, we had Ian McDonald uh, speaking about the contributions of ocular genetics. Uh, so today's theme is improving eye care through teleophthalmology. And uh, I'll just do a brief introduction for each of our speakers. Uh, Dr. Mark Grieve is an associate clinical professor in our department. Uh, and he completed his medical school and ophthalmology residency at the University of Saskatchewan and a retina fellowship at uh, LSU with Golem Payam. And he joined the U of A in 1994 and has been serving in many leadership positions. In fact, when I was interviewing, uh, Mark was the acting uh, chair at the time, and uh, he served as a director of our fellowship programs, uh, still doing that, chair of the OR committee and uh, many other uh, opportunities uh, where he may, continues to lead and mentor us. So uh, it's a privilege to have you with us, Mark. Uh, I know that you enjoy the retina practice, the teaching, the learning, the discovery. Uh, and have been instrumental in, in uh, getting our retina fellows on board, so thank you. Then we have Brad Hins, uh, and Brad is an associate clinical professor uh, and attended medical school and residency as well at the University of Alberta, did his vitreoretinal retinal training at the Wilmer Eye Institute at Hopkins, and has been fa past fellowship director, uh, past chair of the Human Resources Committee, actively involved in clinical research, uh, teaching, uh, and training as well. Abshir Molin is joining us uh, from somewhere in North Africa, I think. Uh, Abshir uh, has been a pioneer as well with the team uh, right from the start uh, and a real pillar. And uh, I would say that he's assisted me in setting up uh, a number of teleophthalmology programs uh, in Kenya, Ethiopia, and other places. And uh, uh, Abshir has a master's of commerce degree from Pune University in India and a postgraduate diploma in information technology uh, and has served as the coordinator for the program. Chris Rudnitsky uh, is joining us and he's a professor uh, in our department of ophthalmology and visual sciences. 
and attended medical school and residency here at the University of Alberta as well. Went on to do a master's in public health uh, at Harvard and is co-director uh, of the University of Alberta Teleophthalmology Reading Center, chair uh, of our uh, undergraduate medical education program and chair of the College of Physicians and Surgeons uh, a non-hospital uh, surgical facilities committee as well. And Chris also serves as chair of the exam committee uh, on the Royal College for Ophthalmology and vice chair of our specialty committee. And then we have Matt Tennant, uh, who's a clinical professor uh, and uh, was also a resident uh, in the University of Alberta. So we have a series of alumni here and did retina training at Will's Eye Hospital in Philadelphia. His research interests include teleophthalmology, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, uh, and uh, retinal surgery developments as well. And you know, a big part of uh, what drew me to the University of Alberta 12 years ago when I was in Ottawa was um, Matt. Matt was program director for the residents, uh, and I was program director in Ottawa. We used to have some walks along the Rideau Canal, and Matt would say to me, you know, we have something pretty special in Edmonton, you should come and visit. And when I saw the teleophthalmology program, uh, which by the way has been developed over 20 years ago, uh, when Matt was a resident uh, and Chris was a fellow, uh, it really pulled me in and I saw the potential. And uh, fortunately, we've been able to build on the teleretina and do some teleglaucoma, teleoncology, telegenetics. And the future, of course, is bright uh, for many other applications. Uh, the um, group has uh, been very successful in academic publications and was recognized for their impact through the CIHR National International Knowledge Translation Award in 2008. Uh, and you can see the citation there. Uh, so I'm very proud uh, of what you've been able to do all together. And um, it's really that spirit of wanting to serve in the best possible way uh, and to do it in a way that uh, models uh, best patient care, set standards, uh, teaching, uh, that is in line with uh, Dr. Marshall's spirit as well uh, in the same way. And so uh, I wanted to uh, acknowledge the fantastic contributions you've been making and look forward to your presentation. I just wanted to let everybody know that we are recording today's session. If you have questions and answers, please enter them in the Q&A box and I'll help to moderate uh, afterwards. And then um, if you want to come off mute, uh, just raise your hand uh, virtually or, or physically and we'll try and get you uh, off mute there, Megan. Uh, or we can just open it up for discussion afterwards. So thank you. And uh, with that, I'll pass it over. Uh, and just wanted to thank Megan and Emily for uh, their support today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Damji and Dean Hevelgarn for taking the time to uh, listen in on our talk. We acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our vibrant community. My name is Matt Tennant, and Chris Rodniski is in charge of the slide deck. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Look. Um, on behalf of Mark Grieve, Brad Hins, Absher Molin, and Chris Rodniski, we welcome you all to what we hope will be an interesting presentation. The easiest way to understand what we have accomplished over the past 23 years is to tell our story. The key elements of our success have been a diverse team, a dedicated community health representative, and her passion to improve indigenous health. Technology and improvements in technology over the past two decades and how failures can always be overcome with problem solving often on the fly. These are our conflicts of interest. Um, Apart from Absher, we're all part of Secure Diagnostic Imaging, a small uh, teleophthalmology company. Unequal access to healthcare is a fact of life for many people living in rural communities and for most Albertans of Indigenous background. There is systemic racism in the healthcare system for Indigenous peoples due to holdover colonial policies, inadequate living conditions, and limited healthy food choices for many. These disparities and barriers to healthy living increase the risk of diabetes. I saw this disparity firsthand when I was a first and second year resident at the University of Alberta, when indigenous patients with diabetes would present late in their disease course with retinal bleeding and vision loss. After moving to Alberta from British Columbia where I grew up and attended, attended medical school, I had kept in touch with one of my best friends from university, Chris Talbot, pictured here with his son and my two kids. We had gone to University at McGill in Montreal. After McGill, 
I'd gone to medical school at UBC in Vancouver while he had been hired by McDonald Detweiler, the company that invented the Canada arm that is now used on the International Space Station. In my second year of residency at the University of Alberta, he contacted me to see if I had any ideas for a telemedicine project. McDonald Detweiler was interested in submitting a proposal with the Canadian Space Agency to government for grant funding in collaboration with the university. That same year, 1997, I had the opportunity to attend the Jasper Retina Symposium put on by Mark Greve and Brad Hintz, both of whom uh, I would join practice and would be my mentors. At that meeting, I had a discussion with Mark Greve. Uh, during the uh, 1997 Jasper Retina Symposium, I had a chance to sit down with a young, eager second year resident who told me he was interested in diabetes and technology. We discussed the fact that so many Canadians were not meeting the recommendations uh, of the COS for yearly diabetic eye exams. Many of these patients were showing up with devastating end stage diabetic retinopathy, which could have been prevented. We felt one of the main reasons for this was that Canada is a very large country uh, with sparse pockets of population, often uh, great distances from large uh, urban centers. Uh, we also felt that this was disproportionately affected to First Nations communities. The answer to this problem was staring us in the face. Uh, all the major diabetic studies use stereoscopic film as their gold standard uh, for evaluating diabetic retinopathy. Uh, what we, we felt, why don't we use the emerging development of digital cameras uh, and the internet to allow all people, despite their geographic location, appropriate care. And so right there in the barley bin at the Jasper Park Lodge on a napkin, Matt and I drew up a plan. Our goal was to uh, try and provide standard of care eye examination to people at great distance. We created a stereoscopic di digital imaging, imaging system capable of identifying and grading diabetic retinopathy that was as good as or better than clinical evaluation. We call this concept uh, distance evaluation it includes taking a history, uh, obtaining visual acuity, measuring intraocular pressure, enter segment photos, and stereoscopic fundus photos. Using this approach, only those patients requiring treatment need to travel uh, to Edmonton. Uh, in 1997 98, uh, the EyeSight program was initiated uh, with the help of Matt's friend, Chris Talbot. It was a $1.4 million grant. Uh, in partnership between the University of Alberta, Donald Detweiler, and the Canadian Space Agency. Phase one was the development of a camera system, stereo viewer software, and uh, teleophthalmology uh, software, including a database acquisition and analysis stations. Uh, phase two was to test the system on diabetic, clinic, um, diabetic patients in the eye clinic at the Royal Alexander Hospital. Uh, phase three was to test the system out in a distant community. As part of the project, a medical student was recruited to participate in, the, in this exciting program. Dr. Kristen Niski would join us and would eventually become the lead researcher for the U of A tele-ophthalmology program. Thanks, Mark. And thanks everyone for coming to our presentation today. So we're gonna kind of travel back in time. We thought the best way to tell the story was chronologically. So we go way back in 1998, fundus photography was a key part in managing patients uh, and all of these cameras used film. So we thought maybe we could replace this with a digital camera and then allow better uh, access to remote communities through a teleophthalmology platform. So we've bought a Kodak DCS 520 camera. This actually cost $20,000. You can see it attached to the top of the fundus camera there in the picture. It was actually upgraded later on with another $20,000 to the DCS 560 which uh, was the camera we used through the bulk of our research that we're gonna talk about. So when you think about this, we spent almost $40,000 to get six megapixel images, which is less than my current iPhone. We had to mill a mount manually, like one didn't exist because when uh, uh, we first tried to connect it, the images were out of focus. And then that mount had to be remilled multiple times in order to get the, the most crisp images. And even more challenging was that unlike most uh, digital things that you buy today, there was no cord on the box. So we didn't have a way of connecting the camera to the computer and so we had to create one. This is what our uh, remote workstation was. So we'd have the camera attached to the digital camera. 
That was attached to a Windows NT based computer using software that was developed in association with McDonald Detweiler and basically was like a very focused local localized EMR. And then because uh, these image files were so large, there, it wasn't easy to uh, back it up. It's, you, you couldn't just go to the store and buy a multi gig hard drive. You can see in our, our photo there that uh, we had an 18 gigabyte disk and that was a very expensive disk at the time. Um, so it wasn't just the same as buying another one. So we backed up to tape. Then we had an analysis workstation. So the idea here is that the photos are captured remotely and then they're transmitted to Edmonton. And uh, we used a first generation stereo reviewer software called TwinView. This utilized LCD shutter goggles. You can see Mark wearing those in the bottom left. And they're synced to the screen to provide a stereo image. Uh, these are uh, video game technology still in use today. Um, and then ultimately these gratings were recorded in Excel. This first system provided a high quality assessment of diabetic retinopathy comparable to film and clinical exam, including for the detection of macular edema. And so because of this, we were able to refer only patients who needed treatment. So this was a big deal. If you think that a person living in Fort Vermilion, all of the, the patients uh, as mandated by the Canadian Diabetes Association should have an annual exam. So every single one should be traveling to Edmonton. Using this system, we were able to reduce that to a fraction of the number of people having to travel. So our first study was the DCS520 study. Uh, we have a lot of very functional names to our research. And this compared the digital images to film. We had 200 eyes and we found good correlation uh, and we're happy with the results. We submitted uh, this for publication, but it wasn't accepted. Like, a, like any good research project, there's some failures. And from those failures, we learned and were able to produce a, a better research down the road. Uh, we had an excellent reviewer who provided many comments that uh, we incorporated into subsequent research. Uh, and then because of that, we're successful in many other projects to come. So then this took us um, to implementation. And um, I think this is you, Matt. Thank you, Chris. As part of the EyeSight program, we were looking for communities in rural Alberta that were interested in collaborating. In order to spread the word, I'd given a presentation to the Aboriginal Diabetes Initiative Committee. Linda Oje, pictured here uh, in green, uh, was a community health representative uh, and she was in the audience. She lived in North Tall Cree. She approached me after my talk to let me know that she was worried about eye care in her community. There was a high rate of diabetes and she wanted me to come and visit Fort Vermillion and possibly have the first rural pilot uh, located there. So after spending a lot of time uh, in the fluorescing angiography room, and for those of you uh, who don't remember this, this is the room now where ultrasounds are done at the back of the clinic in pod three. So I spent many hours, days in the dark with Bern Schwanke taking photographs of patients. And so all of this culminated in, in this project that uh, Matt had discussed with Linda Oje. So we started uh, driving for clinics in Fort Vermillion at the St. Teresa Hospital. This is a picture of the end of the highway. So for about a third of the travel, we had to drive on this dirt road. And ironically, it was actually nice to travel in the winter because the snow and ice filled all the holes. This is our first trip to Fort Vermillion and Matt's Forerunner. Uh, we had a rented U-Haul trailer for the first time. It, inside the trailer, we had a great big box that housed the camera. We had multiple boxes with the computers. We brought our own desk chairs. We had a, a mechanized table so that the camera could go up and down. So it was a lot of stuff to package up and, and transport. It was a heavy load as a result, and there are no gas stations after Red Earth. So we actually took jerry cans to fill up along the way and would stop somewhere along the, the dirt road to top up. We traveled in every season. So we did about four clinics per year. Um, and so to save money, because uh, we didn't have a lot of initial funding, we started using an old trailer of Mark. So you can see it pictured there. Um, as uh, Dr. Damji had mentioned, Mark had done his fellowship in New Orleans. And so this trailer was handmade in Saskatchewan. He used this actually to travel to his fellowship. And uh, it provided some adventure on subsequent trips that we'll, we'll see in some photos coming up. So patients uh, as part of these clinics had digital and film photographs obtained and then both sets were ultimately graded. We also did a clinical exam to ensure that patients received appropriate care. We were worried like what if there was a problem with developing the film and those photos were lost or what if there was a digital failure and we lost all the images. We didn't want those patients to lose out on the appropriate clinical care. Uh, Linda Oje was really instrumental. Um, like one of the things that we started this talk was, uh, you know, a, a focus on teamwork and really um, there was no element of this, this team that was less important. 
Um, but I'd say if I had to say one part of it, or at least there's two parts, there's Absher and then there's Linda, uh, who really made this project a success because they're so motivated uh, to work together and to get everybody to do what they needed to do. Um, Linda encouraged all patients with diabetes from communities around Fort Familiar, and there are multiple Indigenous communities that access St. Teresa Hospital for their care. She even helped her ex-husband to come to have exams done. And if patients no-showed, she would get in her van and she would drive to their house and pick them up and bring them in. Um, I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge Neil Haynes, who was a local GP at the time. He was helpful in getting patients to come and um, just setting up with logistics at St. Teresa. And, through his engagement with us, uh, he got interested in ophthalmology again, and then uh, went through our program and is now practicing in Lethbridge as an ophthalmologist. You can also see Vern Schwanke. Uh, he's in the picture on the right. He's the photographer uh, behind the camera. And uh, uh, he helped with all of our research, all of these projects. He came into every clinic. He even drove the van from time to time. And then lastly, there was a family doctor named Frank Van Etten. Um, so, uh, you know, again, this theme that uh, uh, teamwork through local uh, communities and working together, we're able to get the job done. Um, upload was ultimately done by satellites. This is a picture of the satellite outside of St. Teresa Hospital. Um, this was done because there are no other data lines, like the internet really didn't exist in the way it does now back then. And the speed that this transmitted was two gigabytes per day. So if you think about this, current LTE cellular is about 300 megabits per second. So that's 13,000 times faster than what we used. And that's assuming if the connection could be up for 24 hours in a row, which it couldn't. It often dropped and then the signal had to be reestablished. Sometimes files had to be retransmitted. Uh, so it was, a, it was a bit of a time consuming process. Thanks, Chris. This slide uh, serves to represent all of the amazing Albertans who went out of their way to help us make teleophthalmology a success. Uh, one time following a successful teleophthalmology clinic in Fort Vermillion, we were on our way back on the dirt road when the trailer uh, hitch broke. Uh, Dr. Greaves' work had finally failed. Um, some people driving by... Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> some people driving by stopped, uh, pulled over and said, um, you know, how can we help? And next thing you know, our team had been invited to a work camp for a steak dinner with ice cream. Well, they sent out a welder to fix the trailer and get us back on the road. So this guy, this was about 11 o'clock at night. He's, uh, he's putting our trailer back together. And then uh, after dinner, we got back in the truck and, and drove back to, uh, to Edmonton. Uh, amazing support from the community. What was even more amazing is that he did it all for free. When he found out that we were doing research to help people with rural diabetes patients, uh, he, he said, there's no charge, uh, I'm just happy to help. So it was really um, a good illustration of, of how there, there's so much goodwill out there and by working together, we get the job done. Uh, we eventually moved on to the U of A vehicle rental pool uh, to have a larger and more reliable vehicle. So this is what's pictured here. Uh, we also didn't want to have a trailer. That was clearly a weak link in the plan. Uh, we've ultimately found a way to personalize them with these magnetic stickers and uh, they were a lot of fun but uh, at speed on the dirt road they would fly off so we, we lost a lot of them. I don't, I don't think any of them still exist. So ultimately um, this led to our proof of concept paper. Uh, this is our, our paper published on these clinics uh, comparing satellite transfer digital images to film. This looked at 241 eyes photographed in these clinics between October 1999 and June 2000. Uh, interestingly, 47.1% had diabetic retinopathy, which is a higher prevalence than we find now. In general, when we look at the clinics we run, uh, both clinically and via the SDI telephomology program, about 30% of patients we see have some degree of diabetic retinopathy, from microaneurysms only to proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So it really showed that there was a high prevalence of disease out there um, that uh, we needed to address. Uh, we also found correlation is very high between formats, giving us the confidence to build the program. And on the slide on the right, you'll see a kind of a montage of photographs. And so what this is showing us is a little bit how we differ from the ETDRS. The ETDRS was a major study that, that showed how uh, diabetic retinopathy uh, should be managed. Um, and it also taught us a lot about how to diagnose it. It's the gold standard about how to, to grade the, um, uh, the retinopathy level. So they take stereo photos of all seven fields, but we economized and took stereo photos of the macula and disc uh, because those are where the stereoscopic pathologies like macular edema and neovascularization of the disc reside. 
So uh, knowing that uh, Indigenous people have a much higher rate of uh, diabetes um, than the general population and having had success uh, with the Tall Cree First Nation communities, our goal was to bring distance evaluation of diabetic patients through teleophthalmology to all First Nations communities. Uh, next slide, Chris. <clears throat> Uh, around this time, uh, Indigenous leaders, government funding administrators, and researchers at the U of A, led by Alan Toth, uh, put together a multidisciplinary team to try and assess all the organ systems that diabetes affects. Uh, this was called the SLIC program, which stood for Screening for Limbs, Eyes, Cardiac, and Kidneys. Uh, next slide. Uh, this was a mobile program that went to all 45 Indigenous communities throughout Alberta and evaluated all diabetics on a regular schedule. There were two teams, one for the north and one for the south. Um, this was, the fir was a first of its kind leading program across Canada. Uh, next slide. Uh, the sheer amount of communication and data uh, and organization of this project required the hiring of a teleophthalmology uh, coordinator. Um, I remember the day that we uh, hired Absher Molin. I was sitting in on the interviews with some of the capital health telehealth uh, administrators, and we interviewed a number of candidates. Uh, when Absher uh, came in and interviewed, he was hands down the best candidate for the job. He had a way of uh, relating to all people, making them feel uh, everything was going to be okay. Hiring Absher was one of the best decisions we have made. I learned, learned over the time that the system can't stand on its own. The coordinator is the glue between that holds the patients and communities together with the doctors and the technology. Without both parts, this program fails. Absher is awesome. Right. Guys, to add something there too, but one of the most amazing things for uh, that Absher achieved was to, to uh, establish trust between uh, our program and Indigenous communities. Uh, many Indigenous people have a lack of trust in the system um, and are are fearful when they come for their health care, but. But Absher, seen in this photo on the phone, um, making promises and keeping promises is what, what was made this so successful, that uh, patients knew that when Absher was going to help them, he was going to, and that they could rely on him. And we had that great uh, back room where his office was, we could use as our personal locker. <laughs> So as we developed the basics of the teleophthalmology exam, uh, we needed to further extend our evaluation to better replicate an equivalent in-person exam. Macular edema is a very important cause of visual loss and diabetes. The macula provides our most detailed level of acuity. Leakage of blood vessels from diabetes can cause swelling of the macula. A two-dimensional photo, film or digital, gives visual clues, but not enough to determine the subtle finding we were unable to determine from this image alone if there is macular edema. Our detailed, most sensitive depth perception comes from a slightly different image seen by each eye. Like the stereo fly test with polarized glasses, a slight difference of each image gives us a very fine detailed depth of field. These images independently give depth cues but seen as a stereo pair, there is a three-dimensional depth in rotation we would see. So how do we evaluate clinically? In person, in clinic, we evaluate a patient at the slit lamp with the aid of an imaging lens, either in front of or even better quality when placed directly on the eye as a contact lens. This is called contact lens biomicroscopy. If we're trying to achieve remote assessment, we need something other than a slit lamp. This is accomplished by slide film stereo pairs viewed at a light box with a stereo viewer held in my hand in the right with the red arrow, or digitally with LCD shutter glasses as discussed. So each eye is visualizing a slightly different image. This is showing with Matt with the yellow arrow with his stereo glasses. For remote assessment, a digital image can be transferred electronically. It's much better than physical film for a lot of benefits, such as storage, duplication, and the speed of transfer. So now with the same image I showed you previously with the stereo pair, when viewed through our adapted twin view software and with LCD shutter goggles, we're able to answer the question that yes, there is subtle macular edema in these photos. Today, this answer would be seen more accurately with optical coherence tomography. 
this imaging allows an optical cross-section of the image of the entire retina, pigment epithelium, and choroid. And it is capable of hugely more sensitive evaluation for macroedema than clinical exam, even with contact lens biomicroscopy. And now with our remote reading, um, most centers do send us um, OCT images as well. So to recap, our research aim at this stage was to validate macroedema assessment by teleophthalmology. We needed to prove that its accuracy versus the gold standard film assessment that was used in the early treatment diabetic retinopathy studies. Our distance evaluation requires a comprehensive exam and the standard of care is a dilated fundus exam with contact lens biomicroscopy. So we now needed to prove that stereo digital imaging was as good as contact lens biomicroscopy. To do this, we needed to first train and certify ourselves as readers of film slides so we could validate our conclusions uh, for the research comparing the contact lens biomicroscopy with slide and digital evaluation. To do this, we engaged Rose Brothers. She's uh, from Wisconsin, one of the ETDRS reading centers. And we uh, enticed her to come to the warm Edmonton winter versus the Wisconsin winter, which is quite mild. And she came to Edmonton to certify. And you can see us training in the background. So after a lot of hard work, a lot of Saturday mornings, Chris and I reading images after post-ops, we were very pleased in publishing our results in the prestigious Blue Journal in issue 109, 2002 titled High Resolution Stereoscopic Digital Fundus Photography versus Contact Lens Biomicroscopy of the Detection of Clinically Significant Macroedema. Our conclusion that six megapixel stereo digital photos are comparable to contact lens biomicroscopy for the diagnosis of diabetic retinal thickening justifies and validates a teleophthalmology tool for the assessment of diabetic macroedema. Where we took that from there was um, our challenge was we had these massive images and we had hard drive capacities that, that were straining with all the collections that we were developing. Um, and even though now it seems straightforward that you JPEG compress an image, it wasn't then. Um, in addition, not everybody accepted that JPEG compression would uh, allow one to diagnose fine pathology and fundus photography. For example, in diabetic retinopathy, there are uh, very small, tiny red dots, uh, and they're small, uh, fine lines representing new blood vessel growth. And so many people thought that JPEGs would result in a loss of the ability to see those things. So we nevertheless started looking at different levels of compression from 16 times to 55 times. We incorporated the, this into a new paper. Uh, at the time, uh, Dr. Baker was a medical student uh, and uh, was the lead author on this, this research. We found that exact agreement was at least 90% for 55 times compression and the reproducibility of assessments was good to excellent for all treatment and follow-up recommendations. So this gave us confidence to start using JPEG compression in our research. We then moved on uh, to look at other uh, entities like age-related macular degeneration. And so here we have a um, uh, project by Dr. Riz Samani. I forget if he was a medical student or, or a resident at the time. Um, so there's been a lot of people involved in our research and the team has been, been very large. Um, another aspect that we incorporated into this work on AMD was the non-mid camera. This, this was a much easier to use camera where it had autofocus, it had uh, fixation tracking. Uh, like in comparison to Zeiss FF450, which is the gold standard of taking photographs was amazing. Like the optics of this were fantastic. It's like buying a Leica camera you know, to use for personal photography. Um, but it's very difficult to use. You have to be exceptionally skilled, which is why Bernd Schwenke was a, a trained professional photographer. Um, now, interestingly, like it, it seems obvious today when you, when we talk about these old studies that the photography would work. And so you might think like, why is this at all, um, worthwhile while looking at, but at the time people really truly believed that the very high resolution of film was the only way to see fine pathologies like Drusen and, and subtle RPE changes in AMD. Nevertheless, we found excellent correlation between film and compressed images for all ARIDS levels uh, of AMD. And this study helped to establish teleophthalmology as a means to assess patients referred and then determine advanced testing. Um, this would be around the time when uh, PDT therapy was uh, the most common way to treat AMD. And so then this way, patients who were more likely to have neovascular AMD could have their testing all booked on the same day and potentially even have the treatment done. 
uh, obviating multiple appointments and uh, many uh, rounds of travel. So then uh, this paper allowed us to put it all together. So this is where um, we take the secure diagnostic imaging system as we know it now, which sorts the photos, records gradings, actually can generate uh, an, an automatic assessment of what the level of diabetic retinopathy is, and then generates reports, which uh, for those of you that may not know are available on NetCare. If, you, uh, if you're ever curious, you can look at a patient, uh, I believe it's under the diagnostic imaging tab, and you'll see the reports for, for their SDI assessments. So this study compared JPEG compressed digital stereoscopic images to slide film. It was really the final validation study of the system that we've now used for more than 10 years in Alberta, across Canada, and internationally. Uh, well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you all for the good praises. I don't know if I live up to it, but you'd have to be fortunate uh, but to be associated with this wonderful team. Uh, and I thank you, each and every one of you, for for teaching me uh, uh, ophthalmology, which was one of the key things that got me excited uh, to even help anyone. Um, that out of the way, uh, community engagement is bringing people together around a shared idea such as education, healthcare, transportation, and housing. So this process operates on the philosophy that human beings have higher self and a better self that can work together on tough issues and achieve important results. As a coordinator of this program, I had to choose and adopt tools that would achieve this and continue to be used throughout the engagement process. I'd also have to be an ambassador for the team, as well as for the program in order to liaise with the communities for better outcomes and the following up on appointments, um, rebookings, and possibly reducing the no-show numbers. So knowing the team behind me with full confidence, I went after every referral that was made until I had a client from one of the communities that had missed multiple appointments. Though clients like him is the very reason why the telephonology program was set up in remote locations. How trust was built in the community? Well, here's my version. Uh, a client with uh, proliferative diabetic retinopathy and a clinical, sig clinically significant macular edema was referred. Uh, I, would call, I would call the client. He would not answer the first call, but a few minutes later, I would call and he would pick up the phone and I'd try to convince him to come to Edmonton. He'd always say, sure, no problem. Make an appointment and I'll be there. But come appointment time, he was nowhere to be found. A few days later, I called the patient again. Uh, this time, a lady answers the phone and I asked her, where is Mr. So-and-so? And she says, well, I'm sorry, he's not home, but I'm his daughter, can I help you? Well, there I found a niche. So I started uh, asking her, uh, do you come to Edmonton? And she said, well, I, I do come to Edmonton, not quite often, but sometimes for shopping. Would it be possible just to bring your dad along? And uh, if you know the community, they're very humorous. So she said, will you pay for the shopping? He said, I'd be very happy to help. Um, so we went on talking about uh, how often she comes to Edmonton. She says, well, uh, but what would you be able to do? I said, well, if you can bring your dad to Edmonton and call me, I would be able to set that up. And she says, well, I can't promise when. My dad is someone who would not tell anyone that he doesn't like going to big cities. Said, well, whatever you can do, you need to save his vision. If you can bring him, I would do whatever it takes just to get him treated in the same day so we can bring him home. And I got her excited. Uh, a few weeks later, on a Friday afternoon at 3 p.m., I was actually uh, packed to go to Calgary at 3.30 just to beat the rush. Phone rang. I'm thinking, uh, she's supposed to leave now. What is this? Phone rang. I answered the phone. Unknown number. Hello. There she was. I said, uh, how are you? She said, oh, fine, we're at the bus station. Where? We're in Edmonton. Okay, I said, well, okay, I'll, I'll be right there. I'll come pick you up. Uh, back then it was, uh, but there was no number to call. She didn't have a cell phone. So I knew where she was. So I picked her and the patient, bring her to the Royal Alec. 
and kudos to the Rhode Island Clinic. Um, staff was absolutely amazing. Have them just uh, sit in the waiting room, register them. Uh, he was not uh, um, registered because this was just uh, 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 all of a sudden. And I started scrambling now, uh, who do I get him to see? Uh, I looked, went back, and I, I always had a schedule who was in the OR because uh, most of the retinal specialists uh, but would rotate. And personally, uh, Dr. Grieve was in the OR. I had to rush to the OR. Um, I said, Dr. Grieve, uh, he's in the OR. I said, well, can I, I just need to talk to him. He said, well, okay, went in. Uh, actually, what can I do to help? I said, Dr. Reeve, I have a patient that I probably would only have the chance to see him today, but uh, I don't know if you will see him again. He said, well, I'll come in between cases. I went upstairs and said, well, is there anything that I can do for you guys? He said, no, 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 no. Uh, we're good. They're just a little bit too excited because the dad is not comfortable. So I asked, can I get you a copy? He said, no, 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 we're okay. We'll just wait for the doctor. Dr. Reeve, Dr. Weave came up in between cases and saw the patient and said, well, this guy needs to be treated. He said, well, thank God. Fortunately, treated him with laser. There they went home. Um, I, I don't know that I, if I could have done this with any other settings other than having such a wonderful team, including the uh, uh, Royal Alex Hospital, uh, for all the retinafil. At the backup plan, if there was nobody there, was uh, obviously just the water arc and just say, well, I'm not leaving until this guy was treated. I, I had that confidence with the team that if a patient showed up, that they definitely would do whatever it takes to treat him. After you could do the laser. <laughs> Next time. <laughs> um, so after the program validation, we partnered with the province provide a telephomology service, telephomology services to all Canadians uh, throughout the province. And those were the programs now that are currently set up uh, throughout, throughout the province. Uh, next, Chris. Uh, with the demographic information, currently uh, we've seen 8,168 clients with 21,583 telephomology visits and the referrals would attest the value of this program uh, would be a different subspecialties, retina, glaucoma, and uh, general ophthalmologist. Uh, even the uh, uh, optometrist helped in the area, family physicians, and other and experts. Can I just add one thing? This is one of the things that sometimes uh, isn't appreciated about our program, but even though we talk so much about diabetic retinopathy, the majority of things we identify uh, are things like cataracts and glaucoma. So that's why there's so many more referrals for that. Not to say that it's not obviously very important to identify treatable diabetic retinopathy as the consequences of that are very significant, but this speaks to our desire to provide uh, a system that could provide a more holistic exam, more very comprehensive. So it wasn't that a rural patient was receiving a screening test that um, uh, would give them a certain uh, confidence that they're getting something looked at, but there might be something else wrong with them. This way, we looked at the whole eye and were able to be confident that we're providing care uh, more broadly. Uh, so ultimately, um, we wanted to evaluate this. Uh, so we looked at a, uh, this paper, uh, it was published in the CJO in 2012. This looked at almost a thousand patients that had at least two visits. Many had more, but we wanted to have uh, an assessment of change. So these were patients that had come, um, all indigenous patients come between 1999 and 2009. Um, it used the data from SDI, uh, but also their systemic information that was obtained as part of the SLIC project. We found a, a few key findings. Um, so the progression of diabetic retinopathy correlated with glycemic control. So this uh, really mirrors what has been discovered in other uh, trials like the DCCT. Uh, this is the largest study on diabetic retinopathy in Canadian Indigenous communities, and I want to point out that this was published after consultation with the chiefs of every First Nation in Alberta. Uh, Matt and Absher and I uh, met uh, in a conference room in Edmonton with all of the chiefs, uh, and this was important because when we started this program, uh, they made it clear that they did not want research done to Indigenous people. They wanted us to do research with them. Uh, 
Um, so it was, we gave a similar, well, I mean, a more detailed research presentation um, to the chiefs and it was with their consent that we, we published this. We also found that hypertension was associated with progression. This was an interesting finding in that it initially looked like um, uh, indigenous men were at higher risk of progression, but uh, a multivariate analysis showed that uh, sex was a, um, a spurious thing. It was actually hypertension. Um, so uh, my hope is that uh, people who care for indigenous diabetic patients are able to use this information and focus on this as a, a key measure to help preserve vision. Thanks, Brett, for that information. After the program established in Edmonton, we expanded not only throughout the province, but beyond. First Nations and Inuit Health Branch approached the team in help to help in other provinces to replicate the program nationally. And as a result, the following uh, programs have been, have been set in place. Um, Vancouver Island in Saskatchewan, Manitoba, um, Moose Factory it's in uh, uh, Kenora and the Northwestern Territory. Those are all nationally uh, 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 programs that have been set and uh, still running. Uh, next, Chris. Program picked up the uh, momentum, which resulted in expansion outside of Canada uh, to a place like Cameroon, Kenya, Congo, Ethiopia, and India to share expertise in reading of images and staff training. Uh, Dr. Dieter Lemke, a uh, retired emerge physician who worked in Cameroon as a bush doctor, uh, took the lead first teleophthalmology setup outside of uh, Canada, which led to uh, Dr. Tambe's arrival in Edmonton uh, for one year in humanitarian retina fellowship. Uh, subsequently, with the arrival of uh, Dr. Damji um, in the department, uh, um, a well-known educator in Sub-Saharan Africa for his uh, passion for glaucoma, took the second lead in teleophthalmology setup in, in Kenya, where all the physicians, physician beneficiaries were actually brought to Edmonton or elsewhere for one year sandwich fellowship. Uh, last but not the least, uh, Dr. Mark Reeves' uh, humanitarian project to India led Dr. Teja, Dr. Teja's arrival uh, in Edmonton yet for another humanitarian uh, fellowship. Uh, kudos to the uh, ARC. Uh, doctors who are continuously uh, by, by helping nationally and internationally. I'm uh, so privileged to be part of uh, by, by such a team that I don't know it could be replicated elsewhere. Um, and next, Chris. Oh, uh, that, that's a lot. <laughs> I'm sure it's because of you, my man. Oh, man. I had nothing to do with we it, love you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love you all. If it wasn't for you, I probably wouldn't have been able to do a fraction of, of anything that I could speak of. So thank oh, you're you. A good, you're a good man. Okay, the Alberta Teleophthalmology Program has had long standing support from two groups. University of Alberta has always been by our side and private industry. We started teleophthalmology through a grant application with McDonald Detweiler and the University of Alberta. Later, members of our team formed a small startup company called Secure Diagnostic Imaging Limited. This company was able to adapt to develop new software, new solutions as technology improved. More recently, we have entered into new industry collaborations with Alberta-based companies that focus on artificial intelligence. Orteen is one of these Alberta companies. Orteen focuses on artificial grading of diabetic retinopathy. The goal of our collaboration is to create an artificial intelligence solution that is able to grade diabetic retinopathy at the same level as ETDRS. We're getting close and we're hoping to have a working solution in 2021. Uh, Chris, can you play the video? So this is just an example on the Orteen website where you can upload images and then the images will be auto graded and, uh, and then identified as having microaneurysms, hemorrhage, uh, hard exudate. And using this technology, if you use it for seven field grading uh, and include neovascularization, you can actually create an ETRS grading level. Our second collaboration is with Pulse Medica, another Alberta startup company that started at the University of Alberta. 
And the goal is development of artificial intelligence guided laser treatment. And so this could come full circle where we could use automated detection and then artificial intelligence to identify microaneurysms or areas of non-perfusion for later treatment. The treatment would be guided by a computer uh, with overlay of the uh, artificial intelligence identified uh, diabetic pathology. So maybe Abshir can do the laser then. Uh, thanks for putting us. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he could do it already. <laughs> the, set, the, the success of teleophthalmology has been the result of many champions. We started as a result of Linda Oje, who championed her community to improve eye care and the health of her people. Ian McDonald, Krim Damji, ex-chair and current chair of Department of Ophthalmology, have always championed what we do. And because of their stalwart support, uh, we have been uh, successful for the past 23 years. Numerous other individuals from across the province and around the world, some of whom are recognized on this page, have dedicated their time and effort to improve eye care for Albertans by supporting teleophthalmology. We could not have done this without all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, we, all of us would love to have questions and feedback uh, from the audience. We are so honored to have so many people listen to what we have done for the past two decades. Thank you so much. Um, it's an incredible presentation. And uh, I think um, we can stop the screen share and just engage uh, in some conversation here. I'm just looking to see um, Marianne has her hand raised. So uh, I think Megan is going to do the unmuting. Uh, go ahead, Marianne. Let me just see here. Megan, are you able to uh, unmute? Or Marianne, you'll have to unmute yourself there. Uh, in order to speak. Yeah. You're on Marianne, but you need to unmute her. So while we're waiting uh, for Marianne, I just wanted to say um, what an incredible presentation. I mean, the way you guys coordinated that and shared the stories uh, in plural uh, over time, it's just really humbling and uh, so incredible to see. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, Marshall exemplified was that uh, spirit, right, of caring and service uh, and sharing. And so it's great to see it um, carried forward like this. And my hope is that those watching will also be able to understand the value of a lecture series like this in terms of visiting heritage and carrying the values forward uh, as well. Uh, so Marianne, are you there? Uh, did you want to unmute or uh, Cindy? Um, anybody who's uh, able to unmute can speak there. Maybe while we're waiting for Marianne to get the microphone going, um, I see Cindy Bryant's question about were there any pediatric patients in the study? Which, which study, uh, I mean, in, in general, and any of the studies, or was there a particular study you were referring to in general? Um, definitely. Uh, there weren't a lot, though. I mean, there certainly are uh, Indigenous uh, people with type 1 diabetes, um, so there were a handful in some of the communities that we saw. Um, like they, there weren't any really young children in the study because to take photographs, particularly with the early systems, it was challenging to get these photographs done, even in adults. Uh, so you can imagine if you had a six-year-old who's scared and won't sit still, you aren't going to get great images. So the, I don't know what the youngest patient is, but it would be either a mature, um, you know, 10-year-old kind of thing or teenagers. And then, uh, of course, there are non-Indigenous Canadians um, and Albertans who participate, again, with type 1 diabetes, but um, it really just depends on the level of maturity so that they can sit still to have photographs taken. We don't, we don't really see diabetic retinopathy in that age group anyway, but we do right now when we see images from elsewhere, I do sometimes see images uploaded where it could be like a chirpy or optic nerve, something like that, but they're not part of the routine diabetic screening. I noticed from uh, Absher's data that there was a gentleman who was 109 who had been screened, which is pretty amazing. It is. What do you think about the cameras that are coming in that are non-mid, wide field? Like, uh, is that enough just to take one wide field photo? Uh, so for sure, depending on location, uh, you know, for screening versus assessment, and, and, you know, with Optos and a variety of other new technologies where the image resolution is getting better, um, I, I would say that that will supplant, uh, you know, multi-field imaging. 
Uh, and there, there does remain the problem with media opacity. If you have a cataract or a small pupil, uh, these, these imaging systems may have difficulties capturing a sharp image. And if you're living in, let's say, Fort Chip, and uh, you have an ice highway in the winter or, or flight out uh, in summer, you know, it's a long way to come to be told, oh, well, actually it just was the pupil was too small for a good image. And so for those individuals, dilation would probably be key to make sure that at their own location, you can get good quality imaging, you know, with whatever format you can use. Yeah, you know, one other thing with other imaging, Corinne, uh, with COVID now, uh, you know, Len Smith and Yellowknife, we used to have a lot of patients that had come to Edmonton for anti-VEGF injections. And now uh, he's doing all the injections up in Yellowknife and I'm just reading the OCT images. So, you know, acquisition and, and improvement in technology, you know, we'll, we'll get to the point in our lifetimes here, not too far, where you probably have one wide field photo that gives you a complete uh, out to the equator, OCT, uh, fundus out of fluorescence, color, et cetera. So it's only going to get better with what, what we can obtain um, despite the limitations, though, as Matt said, anterior segment will still face a hurdle. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really exciting in terms of uh, a collaborative approach um, to um, identification, but also management, right, uh, with some of the tools that you guys were talking about. And the patient at the center, and I'm waiting for the day where we can do a selfie and just send it in to you guys, right? Um, really put the patient at the center. <laughs> Marianne, I think, was interested in the artificial intelligence, uh, augmented intelligence approaches and how they may benefit glaucoma. I don't know if any of you want to speak to that. Um, yeah, I could speak. You know, it, it, it is unbelievable. Like, tr truly, it's not believable. And yet it is happening where artificial intelligence is as good, uh, if not better, for diagnosing disease. Uh, you know, using all of this information from machine learning um, the most recent uh, presentations and, and then also publications show that for many, many disease entities of the eye, artificial intelligence is as accurate and likely more sensitive and specific for identification of disease. And so in the relatively near future, your OCT machine or your, your camera will be uh, working with artificial intelligence and, and pre-diagnose whatever is imaged and then you know you confirm it, but but the diagnosis will the likely diagnosis will already be available for you as part of the imaging process. Just like you know for EKGs, you know there's a report that's generated, and you can look at the EKG, but the report is already being generated by the computer. Mm -hmm. That'll be the same for any imaging modality in ophthalmology uh, within the next decade. It, it's it's unbelievable. So the the key still is going to be treatment, although artificial intelligence treatment is also coming. And so, um, you know, all of us will be likely looking for some other work. <laughs> um, question from Donna about how compact are you able to make the system now? Uh, can smartphones be used? Portable technology. The, the problem with smartphones is their, the, re, the, the resolution and the capture to the eye itself just is not perfected yet. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I think the cameras are quite good, but the, the uh, method of getting the, um, image from the eye is still quite small and it's not not very useful yet. But um, I think some at some point that will probably be developed and uh, and we'll you know, have more of that uh, mm -hmm. kind of imaging. Uh, right now we still use pretty large cameras uh, for our teleophthalmology um, because you need the fundus camera. Right, right. But what if you had a phone that was on a mount or a virtual reality headset or something, right? Uh, yeah, I think it's very possible. Interesting, yeah. I mean, with virtual reality, you can now do visual fields, right? That with eye tracking, um, and actually get better results than the standard Humphrey field. So it's it's uh, pretty interesting. Yeah, the world's changing very quickly. In a, in a good way. <laughs> other comments or questions from people, uh, or other reflections that um, you as the panelists have after. Uh, revisiting this journey uh, over two decades. What a remarkable journey. One thing I'd say is uh, just it's, um, you know, never doubt yourself, um, you know, uh, work collaboratively with people. And uh, if you have a good idea for us, we noticed a gap in care and we started going down that line and that's how it all kind of started. So, um, yeah. Yeah, I would say also life is about failures. 
and how you can overcome those failures. And so there was multiple challenges throughout this 23 year journey where technology had changed as an example, CRT monitors, we, we don't have CRT monitors anymore. And Stereopsis for us at that time was only available through CRT monitors. And so we felt sure that it would not be possible. And yet LCD monitors were able to adapt and allow us to see in stereo. And then, you know, early days with digital, you know, the, the medical students in the audience today may never have seen a film-based camera. And, uh, and yet for us, when we started, there was only film-based cameras. And so, you know, the fact that you could buy a digital six megapixel camera for a cost of $40,000, you know, mm -hmm. it just shows you, shows you the transition in Kodak. Kodak was one of the biggest companies in the world. There, there is no Kodak anymore, it's gone. And, um, and so, so failures, you can always overcome them with enough, you know, teamwork and persistence. And, um, and we, we were able to do that. And that's, a, I think, a good, strong life lesson for all of us. Absolutely. Um, anybody else have reflections there? And I know, Anne, you have a question if you want to unmute yourself. The other thing is that I think Jonathan uh, Choi and uh, Shai Amlani and others are from the Alberta Health Services uh, telehealth program are on. Uh, so my thanks uh, to them as well for the support over the years. And I hope we can continue to build on that. Uh, and also the grants from the federal government, uh, many, many uh, sources of support as well. And uh, are you able to unmute there if you wanted to ask or? Doesn't appear to be. Chris, I found that statistic quite an amazing. 30% um, of uh, the photos uh, have pathology. And by that, did you mean diabetic uh, retinopathy? Because uh, I think one of the slides highlighted that, right? But then, uh, as you said, there's other things that are picked up too. So um, what are the other common pathologies? Is it cataract and uh, other things? That, like you take an anterior segment shot as well as the posterior? Yeah, we take the anterior segment uh, shot and then uh, we take posterior segment photos in a sy systematic way. Um, it, the prevalence of diabetic retinopathy is 30%, so that's all levels. Mm -hmm. So approximately 10% um, of patients are referred for their diabetic retinopathy because it's considered to be uh, treatable or included in that or, or the, the handful of patients that would have ungraded, uh, ungradable uh, photos, uh, either due to medial opacity or just inability to sit still or poor dilation or, or something else. Um, but the you know majority of patients that are referred are for glaucoma and cataract. Uh, so it's it's nice. Like uh, we know the thirty percent number uh, also from um, Matt's and my work with the Alberta Di Diabetes Surveillance System. Uh, so we had done some work with them, looking at what that prevalence was, and then when you look at some of the other studies we had had done later on, like uh, we did a. Uh, an assessment of the the Aspen Health Region uh, camera. So there's a fixed camera in Lac La Biche and in Edson, um, and uh, and so we looked at at that group. That's a, a mixed group. It's mostly non-indigenous, but there are some indigenous patients in there as well. Uh, and so the prevalence in that group is about thirty percent, and that, that fits too when you think about what you see in the clinic. Uh, so if you thought about ten diabetic patients, you're going to see, you know, about three of them have some degree of diabetic retinopathy. Thank you. Um, maybe for the retina consultants, how do you integrate uh, some of the learning from telehealth uh, into your workflow? I mean, do you do in this environment currently uh, virtual visits and, and then maybe just look online for some patients, whether it's diabetic or other pathologies, uh, or do you physically have to see everybody all the time? Are there some efficiencies that you've learned about? There's quite a range actually, Karim, of uh, programs that still operate. Um, you know, the... Uh, mentioning there's the uh, regional uh, tele telehealth programs like in Edson and Aspen and I think Port Mac and all other places that are quite far. So those images are coming in and being read. Uh, we have images from optometrists that, uh, that send through our SDI system. Um, we have the ADWP. We're also using you know it for uh, some uh, uh, monitoring of our, our own patients. Uh, as well. So it's, uh, and then uh, I think Brad, you're seeing patients from Northwest Territories. So it's quite a, a wide range. Um, we also encourage some of our international um, fellows like uh, Tasia to 
send and share images uh, through tel through the teleophthalmology system. So, and do you use some of this for teaching uh, purposes as well? It's interesting. In the beginning days, uh, we um, uh, bought a stereo uh, projector, and uh, we would do our fluorescing rounds uh, in stereo. We'd all have the goggles on, and uh, it was it was pretty pretty fun. <laughs> I remember and, seeing the the optic nerves in stereo. That was just drooling about thinking about those days. Yeah, it was, it was pretty exciting. Um, it's uh, it's kind of. Uh, yeah, we use with the advent of OCT, like Brad mentioned, um, you know, the stereo component is sort of, um, although it's important, it's um, in the critical areas of the macular are imaged probably better with OCT. So, yeah. Okay, I think um, just looking to see if there's any other last uh, questions here or if anybody has their hand raised. Uh, don't think so. Um, so, I'd like to uh, offer a few concluding remarks. Uh, once again, thank you so much uh, for sharing uh, such wonderful stories and the evolution over time. Uh, it's a bright future uh, and um, many of the learnings are uh, apropos locally, uh, but also nationally and internationally in terms of uh, standards to practice now. And um, I'm just uh, proud uh, of the work that's being done. And I think uh, Dr. Marshall would have the same sentiments uh, in terms of the pride uh, uh, to be able to see such good work being done. Um, at the end of the day, you know, our department and the Eye Institute is about excellence um, in patient care, research, uh, innovation, teaching, leadership development. And I think this program and all the wonderful things that uh, you've done uh, really exemplify that in a most admirable way. So uh, on behalf of the department, my gratitude, uh, respect and admiration uh, to each of you and all the team members. And I hope that uh, some of the patients uh, you know, particularly Linda and others that may not have been able to attend today uh, uh, can access this. Uh, we hope to be able to uh, put it on our website so you can send the link out. Uh, or um, Absher, you may have to go and uh, visit people in person and show them <laughs> the video and the recollection uh, and the stories. So it was very touching, uh, the stories that were shared and, and so personal and endearing. So my, my heartfelt thanks to each one of you. And thanks to also to the attendees um, for making time today. I just want to wish everybody all the best. Uh, you know, it's a difficult period for sure, uh, but I hope uh, the spirit of the holiday season and the new year will propel everybody forward and uh, maybe next year we'll be able to come together in, in person again. Um, but have a wonderful day and all the best. Thank, Thank you, all. everybody. Thanks, Thanks again. Everyone. Megan. Thanks, everyone. Absher, nice to see you. Uh, yeah, Mike, you guys, all the best. Good night, Absher. Good night. Thanks, Chris, for all the hard work. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.